Welcome to the RSA, where great change makers of the past inspire the game changers of the present. We're shaping the solutions, the future of work, creating a learning society, fair education, the importance of people and place, and regenerative futures. Shifting systems and challenging norms. Change is hard. But by pooling our challenges, ideas and know-how, underpinning them with our proven approach, our living change approach. Working with and through others to realize change. Together, we can make change happen. Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor, the RSA's Chief Executive, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this special event to celebrate the RSA's annual Albert Medal Award. The Albert Medal has been awarded annually since 1864 to recognize the creativity and innovation of individuals and organizations working to resolve the challenges of our time. I'm delighted to be joined by this year's medalist, Professor Sarah Gilbert, who has been recognized by the RSA for her work as project leader for the development of the Oxford coronavirus vaccine. Professor Gilbert's work represents not only excellence in scientific achievement, but it's also an inspirational example of collaborative innovation for the global common good. The Oxford vaccine was developed with AstraZeneca as a vaccine for the world. And the project was underpinned by a commitment to ensuring broad and equitable access across the globe at no profit for the duration of the pandemic. So Sarah, in normal times, we'd be celebrating together with a ceremony in the RSA's Great Room Auditorium at our headquarters in central London. And had we had a few more weeks, that would have been possible, but um, I would have then enjoyed the opportunity of congratulating you in person and formally presenting you with the medal and honorary life fellowship of the RSA in front of an audience of RSA fellows and guests. But we've been slightly beaten by the calendar, so it's not possible this year. But though we can't gather in person to applaud you, there'll be many, many more people watching online joining us from their homes around the world, and no doubt cheering you as we speak. Since we announced you as the recipient of the award a few weeks ago, we've been overwhelmed by the warmth and enthusiasm of the response from our fellows and the broader public. There's a tremendous sense of gratitude for what you and your team have achieved. After all, for millions of us, it is a very personal gratitude, and that includes myself having been jabbed once. Your vaccine is one of the great breakthroughs of the pandemic. It will protect and save countless lives worldwide, and it's lightening a path out of the dark times we've all been living through. So as I take this opportunity to formally, or although virtually, present you with the 2021 RSA Albert Medal, perhaps you could show everyone at home your medal and just say a few brief words on what, Sarah, the award means to you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, and I have the medal here with me. So I can show you all. It's a virtual award ceremony, but it's definitely a very real medal. A real medal. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Society for the award of this medal. It's a very great honour, and it's truly humbling to see the list of previous recipients and to follow in their footsteps. But of course, no significant advances are ever made solely by one person. And in accepting this medal, I do so on behalf of the very large team of people who worked so hard for over a year now to bring the vaccine development to this point. 
there really are so many of them that I won't go through a long list of individual names, but there's one person I feel I really must single out, and that's Professor Andrew Pollard, the chief investigator of the Oxford-led vaccine trials. He has worked ceaselessly, meeting every challenge that it, as it has arisen, and there have been many challenges for us to meet in the past year. His commitment to global public health is a shining example to us all. I want to thank the volunteers who've taken part in the vaccine trials because without them, we would not be able to develop safe and effective vaccines and reach the stage where we are now. And also our partners at AstraZeneca who shared our vision of a vaccine for, a world, a vaccine for the world and helped bring it to reality. And finally, I must thank my family who've supported me throughout the last year and made it possible for me to carry on uh, when times were tough. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sarah, and uh, your comments will take us to a, a question I want to explore later on, which is to do with the collaborative nature of this endeavor over the last year or so. But, but first, I'm sure people will be fascinated to kind of know a bit of the backstory about how it is you chose to develop your career as a vaccinologist. How, how just tell us about the journey that led to you being the right person in the right time uh, at the beginning of 2020? Well, like many people and like many scientists, I didn't really know where my career was going to end up. This, this was not my, my grand plan from the beginning. Uh, but when I was at school, I really enjoyed studying biology and multiple aspects of biology. And it was always um, my feeling that I would like to work in some aspects of healthcare research uh, a new science to improve human health, but I didn't really know how that would come about. So I just carried on studying biological sciences, which was my chosen field when I went to university. But I think I made a very good decision when I took the course that um, I followed at the University of East Anglia, because it was a very broad course. It was a biological sciences course, but it covered aspects of chemistry, mathematics, computing, biophysics, lots of different areas, including environmental sciences and things which um, seemed at the time to be somewhat less related to, to where I really wanted to go. But it really helped me to see how all these different aspects of science work together. And in vaccinology, we actually use very many different disciplines. We have a large team made up of lots of different people with specialist skills. But it's also important, particularly uh, for the people leading the teams, to have some understanding of many different aspects of the science that we need to use. So as you said, it's very collaborative, but it requires broad knowledge as well as a certain amount of specialist knowledge. And when did you ultimately decide that it was this specific area of, of vaccines themselves that you wanted to, to work in? Because with that broad base, there could have been a variety of directions you would have, you would have gone in. So why was it that it, it, in the end it was vaccines that you focused on? Well, it wasn't actually something that I particularly chose. It was, it was something that came about. So after I'd uh, finished my first degree and then I did a PhD in biochemistry, getting into a bit more um, detail over certain parts of, of biological sciences, I then ended up working for um, some companies for a while, uh, research institutes, working on producing proteins that might be used in various different treatments. But then I decided to move back into academia and I actually joined Oxford University some 27 years ago now um, to work on the genetics of host parasite interactions in malaria, which is which is not an obvious route into vaccine development. But what we was, were working on with Professor Adrian Hill, who was leading the group, was looking at how um, genes in the parasite interact with genes in the host, and that involves the immune system. And the work that we were doing led to um, ideas about how to develop a new vaccine against malaria. And that's how I originally got into vaccine development. And that led me into working out different ways of inducing immune responses safely in people, um, initially for malaria, but then realizing that these technologies that we were using, the things that we now call platform technologies, can actually be developed in many different ways and we can use them to develop vaccines against many different diseases and uh, that's been something that's really been crucial in the last year because the fastest vaccines to be developed all use the so-called platform technologies where we have a way of making a vaccine and we know a lot about the technology and we've worked on the technology a lot in advance and then when we need to quickly turn it to making a vaccine against a specific disease even a disease that's only just become known um, 
to science, we can do so much more rapidly than using the old fashioned ways of starting from the pathogen itself and gradually working out how to develop a vaccine from that. So it's, it seems as though really for quite a long time in your career, Sarah, you've, you've had these twin motivations of the motivation that any scientist has of wanting to push forward the frontiers of knowledge simply mm -hmm. for the sake of putting for, pushing forward the frontiers of knowledge, because that's what you do, but also of this possibility of saving lives, of making a difference to, to the world. In order for, for someone to fully understand you as a human being, <laughs> the way in which those two ideas roll together, scientific discovery and human welfare, is that that's your DNA, it seems to me, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's, I suppose that's just how I am. And I work with a lot of other people um, within the university who have very similar ideas. We are motivated, we're curious, uh, we're scientists, we want to find out how things work. Uh, and that's one of the things that really excited me when I was first studying science at university. The idea that you could know a great deal about how a very simple organism such as a virus works. You could, you could try to understand all the aspects of how something uh, behaves biologically, um, what you can do to influence that. So there's that kind, kind of scientific curiosity, understanding the natural world, understanding how things happen, and then turning that towards how can we use that? How can we change it? How can we use what we know to develop treatments, to develop vaccines? Um, because if we understand the system, then we can start to modify it and we can try to change things to bring benefits, to bring health benefits. So you've also kind of worked at the intersection of, of, of pure science and applied science. And I'm, I'm interested in, in the relationship between, uh, as it were, science for science's sake and science, which is undertaken with a very specific set of purposes attached to it, whatever those purposes are. And also the particular challenges for you as you've, as you've been more and more working in the domain of applied science in recent years. So one of the challenges in working in vaccine development in any field where we're going to develop treatments or vaccines that we want to test in people is that we have to be very aware of the regulatory requirements around doing that. And regulatory science is a very large area and a developing area. And that's all put in place so that um, scientists like myself can't just cook up something in the lab and then go and start um, injecting it into people, even if they've said they're happy to have that happen. We can't do that. We have to have very detailed systems that ensure the quality of what we do. If we make a vaccine, it has to be exactly what we say it is, and it mustn't be contaminated with anything else. And there are a huge amount of procedures and regulations put around that to ensure safety. And we have to, as scientists, work within that system. But we also can challenge that system if we feel that the, uh, the regulatory process requires us to do tests which are very outdated. And remember, these, these are um, protocols that have been developed uh, over many decades. And um, sometimes the old fashioned way of testing vaccines may seem outdated and we want to replace it with a modern molecular method, which will actually tell us much more about the vaccine. We still have to go through the process of demonstrating that that will give us the answers that we need to know about. And we have to prove that to the regulators before they will accept changes um, to the tests that we want to do. So it's a really important part of vaccine and drug development to work with regulatory science. And uh, we're continually trying to be innovative in the ways that we test drugs and vaccines to really make sure that they're safe, but also to reduce the time it takes to know that they're safe. Uh, and that enables us to go faster and it reduces the costs and those things are, are all good. So we are continually thinking about new ways of working, but also whether they are fit for purpose. And um, that kind of brings us back down to earth because if we're going to work with people in clinical trials, particularly healthy people who are volunteering to take a vaccine to find out more about that vaccine, we really have to be very careful to protect their health. Now that's fascinating. I mean, in, in the area that I spend more of my time working on, looking at, at issues around policy and labour market policy, um, the, the, there's a kind of tendency sometimes lazily to assume that regulation is an inhibitor of innovation um, and entrepreneurship, but, but actually it isn't. Often, actually, if you understand the regulatory framework, 
it, it can help you to get your innovations right and to understand the model of entrepreneurship that's going to be uh, sustainable. And that, that sounds like you, you've seen regulation actually as a spur to your thinking rather than something which inhibits innovation. Yes, the regulation is absolutely required. We couldn't work without it, but we can also work with it to be innovative in the uh, in the way that we develop vaccines. And the regulators, particularly in the UK, the MHRA, have been very good at working with us to help us assess whether we can make changes, whether we can um, achieve savings of time in a way that is still safe by using new technologies. And it, it's that's actually quite an important area to work in. And um, I think in any regulated system, rather than fight it um, it's, and assume that it's unhelpful, it's necessary to understand why it's there, uh, exactly what it does, and then you can work to improve it. I was a member of the government's Industrial Strategy Council until it was abolished a few weeks ago. And one of the, fi the final report we did actually was about the lessons that could be learned from um, the vaccine development and, and, and rollout. I mean, even before COVID, there was a lot of discussion about how it was, how it might be possible to speed up the process by which innovative uh, treatments uh, could be tested, uh, particularly when sometimes there were patient groups themselves who would have wanted to, to would have been willing to, uh, to, to, to take those treatments. Um, do you think that, and I'm not talking here specifically about uh, uh, about your vaccine, about, about the vaccine, or even about COVID, but do you think the experience of the last year may 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 further that debate about how it is we can possibly accelerate medical inno innovation in the future? I think it will contribute to that debate, and I'm optimistic that we will be able to move somewhat faster than normal in the future. But Remember, we've been working in very special circumstances this year where everybody accepted that it was incredibly important to have safe and effective vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. And the regulators have really prioritized their review. So one of the things that's really speeded up the review process is just starting earlier. Normally, we would um, complete our dossier of information, have everything uh, completely finished, and then provide it to the regulators in one go, and they would then start their review of that um, dossier. But we've been doing rolling reviews with regulators this year. So as soon as one part of the information is complete, we've provided that, because we don't just provide information about the vaccine itself. Um, we have to give a lot of information about the manufacturing process and about the preclinical testing that's been done on the vaccine. So as soon as any part of the information was ready, we provided that so they could complete their review, ask questions. And then that when we got the final pieces of information we needed to ask for permission to start a clinical trial or move to the next one, they were able to review in a very short space of time because they'd already done much of the work that was needed. But that's not an efficient way for the regulators to work. They were devoting a great deal of their time to work on just the COVID vaccines. So although I think we, we can probably go faster in the future, um, we won't necessarily be able to go as fast as we have done this year because it requires so much input from so many people and you can't prioritise everything. So we have to find an efficient way of, of working when there are many different things to assess. So let's go back now to January of 2020. And I'm really interested in two different things, Sarah. One is, I mean, I hope this isn't going to be too anecdotal, but, but, but simply how you first heard um, about coronavirus and, um, and how you kind of responded to it, and whether you immediately recognized what this was going to mean for you and for your life and for your work. But, but secondly, also in, in layperson's terms, if you can, how the work that you had done up to that point meant that you and your team were incredibly ready for the challenge of responding to this new virus. So after I worked on malaria vaccines, I diversified into working onto um, viral pathogens that can cause outbreaks or pandemics, so influenza. But then more recently, um, other diseases such as Lassa fever virus, which causes uh, a lot of disease in West Africa, Nipah virus, which causes outbreaks in Asia, particularly in Bangladesh, and MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which is another coronavirus that causes uh, a lot of cases and sometimes hospital outbreaks in the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia. 
And this was something that was uh, of greater interest um, since the Ebola outbreak in in West Africa in 2014, when it was recognised that even though there had been quite a bit of vaccine development on vaccines against Ebola as part of a US biodefence programme, because it was feared that Ebola might be weaponised, there still weren't actually any vaccines that were ready to use in West Africa when there was a large outbreak and people needed to be protected. So um, the WHO uh, and other organisations started to encourage people to try to accelerate the development of vaccines against these known pathogens. Um, and using the platform technologies to be efficient to do this. Because if we invest in a suitable platform technology, we can then save a lot of time and a lot of money when we use that to develop multiple different vaccines. And the aim would be to have stockpiles of vaccines or possibly use vaccines in local areas. And there won't be a great deal of funding to support that. So we have to think about how to be efficient and how to use technologies that are appropriate that don't require frozen storage, for example. And so I've been using adenoviral vector vaccines and some other viral vector vaccines in my research, developing vaccines against multiple outbreak pathogens and also influenza, which we know in the future will cause pandemics. There will always be more pandemics of influenza and we should be ready for those. Um, but when I then um, first found out about the SARS virus, I knew that we had technology that we could use to develop a vaccine against it pretty quickly. So the first I knew of it was not really anything about the virus itself. It was just reports on the very first day of January 2020 um, on websites that cover um, outbreaks, disease outbreaks in humans and in animals, saying that there was a cluster of uh, SARS-like pneumonia cases in China. Uh, and that was all there was at, at that point. So. SARS, the virus that we now call SARS-CoV-1, caused an outbreak um, some years ago, and then the outbreak was contained, and we still don't have vaccines against that virus, and it hasn't come back. But there's always been the thinking that that virus might return. It caused an outbreak once. It probably hasn't disappeared from the face of the earth. So was this SARS? The, the, the disease looked very similar. Was it the same virus? Um, and at the time, all that was being reported was a cluster of cases. So it appeared to be an infectious disease, probably viral, but it wasn't certain. As the days went on, um, it became clear that it wasn't the original SARS virus and it wasn't influenza, but it was a coronavirus. It was a coronavirus that nobody had identified previously. Um, and because I'd been working on the MERS coronavirus vaccine, I already knew as soon as it was announced that it was a coronavirus, I knew how we could make a vaccine against that. I knew that there would be a spike protein on the surface of the virus, a glycoprotein, and that if we can induce an immune response against that, we would likely to be able to get protective immunity in people, and that we could do that with the adenoviral vector that I'd been using to develop the MERS vaccine. So initially, when I read about the cluster of um, pneumonia cases, I was interested. Um, I wanted to see how that would develop. I didn't immediately think that we would have to make a vaccine against it. It could have been influenza. It could have been um, another virus. It might have been something that we already had a vaccine for, but there was always the possibility that it would be a novel virus and that's what it turned out to be. And so before the point when the genome sequence was made available, I'd been talking to a few key members in my team uh, and we decided that we should start to make a vaccine against it. And at that point we didn't know how big the outbreak would be. It might have been contained very quickly um, with the old fashioned contact tracing and quarantine measures. And we might have started to develop a vaccine that it turned out nobody needed. But on the other hand, if we did need a vaccine, it was the best thing to do to start as soon as we could. So that's what we did. And that's fascinating. And then it's what's interesting to me, Sarah, in a way is, is that the, 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 the scientific process was relatively straightforward because of the work that had been done in, in advance. And that points to an important point about resilience, I guess, which is that as a world, we need to be in a position where people like you have got the tools ready to respond when a challenge like this occurs. But even if the science was relatively straightforward because of the work that had been done up to that point, you have then got the process of going from the scientific insight to ultimately a situation where, you know, as we speak, 
getting on for half of the British population has been has been vaccinated. Tell us a bit about the collaborative process that is involved in, in getting from the beginning to where we are in, in that process. And, and in my question, Sarah, I'm being guided by some of the questions that have been sent in by our fellows and the public since we announced your award. And um, uh, uh, one of the uh, questioners, Ellie, uh, asked if there's a kind of single, one single thing in that process that you would say was absolutely critical, mission critical to success. And this has been an amazing success. What was it? Well, I think the key to the success was to get started as soon as possible and to plan all of the steps that we needed to go through as much as we could so that we didn't have any delays between one step and the next. So it's a complicated process. We have to produce a first small batch of vaccine in a research lab. We have to get it into a manufacturing facility that can work within the highly regulated environment that we were talking about earlier to produce a vaccine that's suitable for going into clinical trials. And that takes time. And so we have to start it immediately. We, we didn't want to wait uh, produce our vaccine in the research lab, test it in animals, see if it induced an immune response, decide whether we should carry on. We had to do everything at risk. And, and that means starting everything at the earliest possible opportunity so that there was no delay. So as soon as we had the genetic sequence ready to make the vaccine in the research lab, it also went into our manufacturing facility and the team there very experienced, um, produced the, the first batch of the vaccine there, and they provided from that facility the seed stocks that went around the world to all of the manufacturing facilities that are now making the vaccine. So that was really key. And had we not had our own on-site GMP manufacturing facility where we can make a vaccine of suitable quality, we wouldn't have been able to do this. We wouldn't have been able to work with external partners with anything like the speed. And in fact, what we did, um, was to say that we'll stop some other work that we've been doing um, at our manufacturing site and prioritize this one instead. Um, we had to plan the clinical trials. That means working with a different people, a team of people in the clinical center. Again, very experienced. They all have been through this process many times before, so they know how it's going to work, but they had to get their um, applications ready for the regulators and the ethical committees, put in place everything that we needed and make sure we had all the supplies. And I, I do remember at one point, the almost insurmountable problem that we couldn't get enough thermometers for the clinical trial. We always give our volunteers a thermometer and ask them to take their temperature after they've been vaccinated, and we just couldn't source the thermometers. So there are continually problems like that cropping up that different people had to go off and solve all the time to keep everything moving, because what we weren't going to do was just stop and wait until we could find some thermometers somewhere. So we were also planning past that point, we were planning for more advanced clinical trials. We were planning to do clinical trials in multiple different countries. And again, the key thing was not to wait and see how it went and then think about the next stage, but to, to plan the whole process as rapidly as we could. And that was quite difficult in the early days. We were working on planning preclinical studies, um, GMP manufacturing, the first clinical trials, talking to partners around the world, and also looking for a partner which turned out to be AstraZeneca, who would be able to manufacture the vaccine at scale, because obviously as a university, that's never something that we're going to be able to do. No, well, it's a fascinating process. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's, that's kind of, it's inspiring about that is that, you know, we're talking to you and you're of course, absolutely central to this story, but it sounds like there were all sorts of other people that we'll never hear about, in a sense, the, the, the person who spotted the problem of the thermometers and sorted it out, whoever, all sorts of people. It's, it's reminiscent, isn't it, of that, the, it's a bit of a cliche, but the story about the guy sweeping leaves outside NASA who's asked what he's doing, and he says he's contributing to man landing on the moon, that, that mm. this really is an effort that involves a whole variety of people. And actually, if any small part of that could go wrong, it, it could have lost valuable, vital weeks. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. Really big team effort, lots of different people taking the responsibility as well. Uh, there wasn't really time to set up new organisational structures and build new teams the way that you would traditionally do it. It was more a case of people who had the right experience coming together and working together and making sure that we had everything covered. And that fortunately happened more or less organically um, because we didn't have the time to put together teams of people 
uh, and make sure everybody knew what they were going to be responsible. We had to rely on people's experience and knowledge to know what was going to be needed and to know what their role was and make sure that we had everything covered. And the first uh, paper that we published on our clinical trial reports last summer had something like 600 authors on it. And that just shows you the, the number of people who are contributing to the trials. That was just the first phase one trial at four clinical trial centres in the UK. Uh, we then expanded to a further, well, to a total of 19 clinical centres in the UK. And we work with partners in Brazil and in South Africa and in Kenya to extend the trial so that we were testing the vaccine in different parts of the world, which is really important because we want to know how well the vaccine works in different parts of the world, in different ethnicities, in different geographies where people might have been exposed to different pathogens in the past or different environmental bacteria all the time. And all of those things can have an influence on how well a vaccine works. So we relied on existing experience. We, we couldn't have done this unless all of these people already knew how to do their job. And the, the challenge was to coordinate all of this and get it all moving in the same direction. But everybody was so willing to help that it worked uh, really very well. Yeah, and that's, that, that goes along with a, a, a way in which the RSA tends to view the world, we, we, if we're talking about as part of our Living Change campaign, which is to understand innovation as a systemic quality. You know, it, it is to do with brilliant individuals and, and moments of, of inspiration, but it's much more a consequence of how a whole system uh, works. Now, Sarah, tell us about where you think, I know as a scientist, you'll be very circumspect about predicting the future, but tell us how you think things may unfold as we go forward. I mean, we are sitting in the UK in the incredibly pr privileged position of being ahead of, of almost uh, everywhere in the world um, in terms of our rate of vaccination and the figures looking very good. But in other parts of the world, things are looking much more grim at the moment. And we are seeing, as I guess you'll tell me is inevitable with all viruses, we are seeing different strains um, emerge with different um, uh, characteristics to them. Are we now going to be in a kind of arms race between the capacity of the virus to mutate and and mutate partly in response to the vaccine and our capacity to develop variations of the vaccine, new types of vaccine to, 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 meet, to meet that? How, how do you think things are likely to unfold over the next year or so? Well, it's a very complex situation and um, no part of it is is black and white. There are shades of grey in all of this. So one thing that is, is probably in our favour is that coronaviruses don't tend to mutate very quickly. They're not like influenza viruses, um, which change very rapidly, or HIV, which even within one person is hugely genetically diverse. Um, and a lot of the changes that we are picking up around the world are similar changes in the virus arising in different places. So it's not a virus that seems to... Um, to change very rapidly, uh, which is helpful. And we know that the antibodies that are induced by prior infection or by vaccination can still respond to a certain extent, even to the new variants. Now they don't bind them and neutralize them as effectively, but there's not a complete escape from the immune response. So that tells us that if we um, are able to get really strong antibody responses from the vaccines that we're using now, Although we might have less protection against mild disease with the variants, we're still likely to get good protection against severe disease. And when clinical trials report their efficacy results, they're reporting against the milder end of the spectrum in disease. And it's important to, to do that because we want to know that the vaccines can prevent mild disease. And the reason that the trials don't um, have hospitalization or death as as what we report on in the trial, the so-called endpoints, is because those occur less often than the mild infections. And so the clinical trials would have to be absolutely enormous to be able to report any significant findings against hospitalization or indeed death. But we have shown in the clinical trials that with the, the smaller numbers of people who in the control group were admitted to hospital, we're getting very, very strong protection against admission to hospital and also against death in all of the clinical studies. So we may be in a situation where the vaccines that we're using now stop all disease, even asymptomatic disease, um, 
in the virus that exactly matches the vaccine. And in the viruses that have changed somewhat, it's not as effective against mild disease, but mild disease is like having a cold. It's not something that we really need to worry about as an individual, uh, but we'll still be getting protection against the severe disease that puts people in hospital uh, and, and makes them really severely ill. And that's really important to think about in terms of the effect on healthcare systems, because healthcare systems are not affected by people having a cold. They're affected by people getting severe disease, needing hospital treatment um, and possibly extensive care. And we're also now seeing that um, as time's gone on, people who've been admitted to hospital with severe disease and discharged frequently need to be readmitted. They're having long lasting problems that, that aren't cured at the time completely that, that they leave hospital. So we may be coming to a point where we're still protecting the healthcare system. We're still stopping the severe disease but we are seeing some mild disease. And the, the downside of that is that there will still be some onward virus, virus transmission. And when there's virus transmission, that means there's further opportunities for the virus to mutate. So I think our best approach um, uh, is to continue vaccinating with the vaccines that we have now because they, they will work pretty well against the variants, even not as well as they did against the original viruses. And if we can keep the, the R number down, the, the reproductive number that everybody's very familiar with now, if we can reduce transmission to such a point that it's not sustainable, we'll still have very good effects on um, the illness of, caused by this virus across the whole population. The other side of it is that all the companies who've been developing vaccines are working on new versions of the vaccine that will now match the new variants that we're seeing. Um, and those are beginning to be tested by different companies and those are likely to give even higher level protection against the variants. So that work is happening and that work needs to continue to happen. But I'm actually quite an optimistic person. I think that we're going to get good control of the virus. We're not going to completely eliminate it. It's going to be something that we live with, but then we do live with, other, with four other coronaviruses that circulate among the population every year and they cause us a cold. Um, and it's only in the very young and the very elderly that we see severe disease. And I think that SARS-CoV-2 may eventually, once more, pop more of the population has been vaccinated, move into that category where it's still there and we need to keep an eye on it, but it's not a major threat to us anymore. And presumably, Sarah, it's going to be very important that we have high levels of openness and global cooperation because these... I mean, we're seeing people in remote and in parts of the world a long way away from Britain suffering from what is sometimes called the Kent variant. So the capacity to understand where these variants are first identified and to for the global scientific community to be aware of what's going on, that must be an important part of how we maintain our resilience. It's really important that we stay joined up. I mean, it's interesting to, to hear about the naming of the variants that we have. There's the Kent variant, the Brazil variant, the South Africa variant. Those are named after those places because they, that's where they were first identified. But that's where there's a lot of surveillance happening. And if you don't look for something, then you're not going to find it. So we don't know whether similar viruses are arising in many other parts of the world and indeed what exactly is going on in other parts of the world. Um, I don't think it's true that those viruses have only arisen, arisen in those places and spread from there. We, they've been found there because that's where people have been looking. So we need to be doing more of the looking across the world. And we certainly need to stay joined up in sharing all of that information. And then finally, so I'm like, I'm talking to you for hours, but we've nearly run out of time. Uh, say a little bit about the potential of these platform technologies in relation to other pathogens, other conditions. What do you, I mean, one day maybe you'll be able to move on from your focus on this virus what do you think is the potential for this science and technology to have a wider impact beyond the virus? Well, I think that, that there is a lot of potential with um, certain pathogens for which we either don't have vaccines or we need better vaccines. But it's not going to be um, a complete sea change in all of vaccinology. So there are some diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, influenza, where it's really difficult to develop vaccines against those diseases for different reasons. So HIV, even within one individual who's infected, there will be there is a huge amount of genetic diversity. 
Uh, malaria is quite a complex parasite. It can express different proteins on its surface at different stages of the life cycle as it moves through the body. Uh, it can change those proteins that are being expressed. And to develop a vaccine against malaria is a really complex thing to do. Um, TB as well, um, quite a large bacterial genome, uh, very slow growing, difficult to seek out and destroy once it gets into the body um, because it hides away from the immune response. So for those diseases, th these are not the complete answer. There's other work that needs to be done as well. But for other diseases like polio, we're close to eradicating polio, but we're only going to achieve that if we actually um, manage to keep vaccinating against polio with a type of vaccine which never results in transmission of the virus. So we have to stop using the live attenuated polio vaccine because that can you, uh, result in some uh, virus transmission after vaccination. Um, and if we switch to the inactivated polio vaccine, that's less effective. Uh, you need to give it more often. And you also produce it by growing very large amounts of polio virus and then inactivating it. And that's not a particularly safe way of manufacturing a vaccine. So I think we could um, have a better polio vaccine to complete the eradication process, which is something that's very much on the cards. Uh, for yellow fever virus, the vaccine that we use is, again, a live attenuated vaccine. It has some issues with safety and it's probably not particularly difficult to use a platform technology to develop a new vaccine against the yellow fever virus. Uh, and with the other emerging pathogens, we now do have some vaccines against Ebola. Um, MERS, Nipah, Lassa, we still need to work on those. Crimean, Congo, hemorrhagic fever, which affects sheep in Europe and then can transmit into humans as well. We need to be thinking about those. And that's where platform technologies probably can really have a very large impact. Fascinating. Well, sadly, that really is all we've got time for. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Sarah, and congratulations again. Thank you to everyone watching. Uh, for all of those who submitted questions, I'm sure many of you listening will have noticed how your questions have shaped a conversation that I've uh, had with uh, Sarah. Uh, I've mentioned that this event is part of the RSA's Living Change season, and you can find all the talks, podcasts, and essays in this series on the RSA website, the rsa.org. And you'll also find more information about our future change framework and the many projects our research team and fellowship networks are engaged in globally. We'd love to welcome you to our Changemaker community. And if you've been inspired to find out more and get involved, do get in touch. Thank you again to Professor Sarah Gilbert, the 2021 RSA Albert Medalist. And thank you all for watching and good night. <laughs>